。接下来这场演讲，讲师是游戏市场行销顾问 Chris Zachary Zakowski， 题目为《如何观察市场并预估你的游戏表现》。Hi, my name is Chris Zakowski, giving a talk here at the Taipei Game Developers Forum. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to give a talk here. So my talk is how to study the market and to anticipate your game success. Now, a lot of the times I get the question, "How do we become the next Valheim?" or "Should we use TikTok?" and "How many wish lists do I need?" All very valid questions, but it's hard to know. And the reason I get those questions is because I write a weekly blog called HowToMarketAGame.com. And I just look at various angles of how to look at the market and how to market your game better. Now, I also give a free class on how to improve your Steam page. I focus mainly on Steam, so that's why I decided to create this free class. You can join it here just by howtomakeasteampage.com. So I've created that class just because I've had a very unique perspective into Steam and how it works. And so I want to share that with you. And a lot of times, what I do is I just do one-on-one -on -one coaching.、Uh, that's how I also find out a lot of how the industry works. You can contact me if, if you have questions about my coaching and how to improve your own Steam、uh, marketing abilities.、Uh, there's my email address right there. And through all that practice and really meeting other indies and seeing what works and what doesn't, I've kind of come up with this three-step system for analyzing the market. I'm going to answer those questions of exactly if you know you're on the right path. So I'm going to cover it in three parts, and let's dive into step one: Is this a viable genre? Now, the viable genre is something that people kind of skip over. They get so excited about their game that they skip over this very important step. And the secret to Steam success is really comes down to genre. Steam is very genre centric.、Um, I did a study recently where I looked at all the games that have been released on Steam. This is a chart representing all the different games on Steam. Now you'll notice that. I've kind of broken it down into different genres here, and the bars represent how many games on Steam are tagged with that genre. So, as you can see, puzzle is the number one genre on Steam here, with close to 4,000 games. Platformers are close second with、um, about 2,500 games. Now, we can use some estimation and see how many sales. And how much revenue is generated by those? By a, a, a sneaky trick, which I'll show you, which is just basically looking at how many reviews a game has, and then you can correlate that with the number of sales that have have been made of the game. So let's take a look at that. I graphed it against the number of games. As you can see, this median earning, which is the red line,、uh, maps against the number of games released. And as you can see, puzzle and platformer, while there are tons of games released there. They actually don't earn that much. They're not high in the median earning. The games that actually have a very high median earning, like 4x and building, city builders, souls likes, have a huge earning, but there aren't that many games released. So as you can see, there's a real difference in the games that are released and the games that make money on Steam. The typical Steam shopper really cares about some genres and just doesn't care about others. However, the market hasn't responded to this indifference as、uh, this difference in、um, what is desired by the customer versus what is actually being made. So, if you're looking at this and maybe you're making one of those genres that maybe doesn't have the highest earning, and you might think, "Well, I'm just going to work extra hard at my marketing."、Um, maybe pixel platformer is your game. You know, I said that it's the second most common game on Steam.、Uh, you're just going to say, "Hey, I'll just work extra hard at marketing my game," right? Well, let's see what happens here.、Um, I I like to describe how to fix this, kind of with a story of my own. So this is where I live. This is where I grew up. I'm in the U.S. in the very southern corner in this little town called Tucson. It's in the deserts of Arizona,、uh, which is the desert area of the United States.、Um, this is my hometown. This is where I grew up. This is my actual house where I grew up. And as you can see, there's cactuses right there in the front yard. I am literally surrounded by the cactuses that you see in like cartoons. Uh, talking about the desert. That's where I grew up. We really didn't have much experience with snow, too much rain, that sort of thing. So if you were to come to me and said, "Chris, I have an idea. I want to start an independent ski company selling skis and snow equipment to people in Tucson,"、um, 
and we're going to go and we're going to tweet cool ski memes and we're going to have locally created artisanal ski makers to come to Tucson and, and build the best skis that have ever been made, but they're going to be made in Tucson. And we're going to hire ski influencers to tell the people of Tucson about how great our skis are. Guess what? All of that marketing activity doesn't matter because in Tucson, we just don't ski. We're just not a skiing people. There's not much snow around to ski. So I even looked in Tucson. There aren't even any ski stores in Tucson. Nobody is selling skis in Tucson. So what this lesson here is, is there are certain things that some people just will never buy. And on Steam, there are certain genres that players really like, and there are certain genres that Steam players just don't like. It's just almost like selling skis in Tucson. There's some genres that players just don't like. So we're going to show you in this next step how to actually determine what those genres are and how well they're selling on Steam. So this is step one. Let me show you how to make it. Now, you might be looking at this chart and say, well, everybody on Steam should just throw down what they're working on and make 4X games. It's not actually that easy. I'm going to show you why. I like this chart. I didn't come up with this idea. I just kind of assumed a bunch of other ideas that a bunch of other people had about this. But to make a game, there's three parts. You have to make a game that you like, that you personally like, games that you're able to make, like you have the technical ability, and games that the market wants, what typical Steam players want. And where all those intersect is where you should make a game. Okay, so it's going to be different for everybody, but let's take a look. So the games that you like, that's easy. You just look in your brain and you say, hey, what kind of games do I like? Now, you might be thinking, hey, you can't let the market determine your creativity. And that's totally true. You shouldn't start with the market first and then make your game. Look at the games you already like and pick from those the games that sell well. For instance, anytime I come up with a crazy game idea, I put it in this document. It's a Google document. And I just write down in a couple sentences what my ideas are. I have literally thousands of ideas. I, I pulled a, a look and it's 98 pages of just random ideas that I have. So I have no shortage of ideas. I will never make all these games. And what I'm telling you is really start with all these ideas that you have and peel away the ideas that just aren't marketly viable and start with those that are viable. So it's not the fact that you're trying to make a game to please the market. It's really you're looking at your ideas and figuring out which idea that you've had actually fits in the marketplace. So that's, that's, games you like. Now let's look at games that the market wants. Now this is from a website called vginsights.com and if you subscribe to the uh, professional tier they will show you this wonderful graph that shows all the different types of games and all the different genres and how well they kind of sell on a median area. So it's broken down by genre and as you can see there's certain genres like puzzle that there are not making that much money, but there are lots of them. And then there's other genres like roguelike, which is kind of like right in the middle. There aren't too many made and it doesn't make a whole lot of money, but it's like right in the middle. It's up to you to find the combination of games that make a lot of money and there aren't too many of them. So there's not too much competition. It's a hard thing to do, but I really like to use this site VG Insights to kind of help me find those genres. Now, the other thing you should do is as break down the average price, revenue, and median revenue. And this will just help you kind of gauge what the market is, is allowing for games like yours. And this leads to games you are able to make. So in any industry, in any statistical sample, there's going to be a kind of a bell curve of earning potential. There's going to be a huge bulge of median cases, and then there's going to be some outliers that don't make much money, and then some that are super lucky and they make tons of money. The idea here is to kind of look at the types of games that fit each one of these kind of, you know, three parts here. And we're going to take a look and I'm going to show you how to find games that kind of align the spectrum. Okay? And the reason we're doing this is our goal here is to look at a genre that we might be making a game for. And we want to see like, okay, what does the median earning game look like? Is it very complicated or is it easy for us as development team to make it or is it way too hard? So what I want to do is look at this distribution and see like, is the median game, the center game here, really easy? Like I, I see the game on the left, 
I bet I could make that. Our, our team is very competent. We could probably make a game that looks like that, that 50 percentile. But you could look at the games that are making a ton of money and say, whoa, they are really complicated. I don't think our company can make a game that complicated. The graphics are amazing. It's just out of our budget. It's out of our skill set. And this is where you got to be honest with yourself. You're going to see kind of what the competition is like. That's what we're trying to do here. Now, alternatively, you could do this research and you could find out that the game that earns on the 30th percentile of this is way too busy. Like, whoa, we can't even make the game that's at the 30th percentile. And look at the game that's at the 60th percentile of earners. Oh, I, we are way priced out of this market. There's no way we could compete with this genre. That's what we're trying to do. So in situations like this, it might be best just to step away and say, you know what? We can't make a game to compete with these. We just can't do it. And the way I figure out these distributions is through a site called games-stats.com slash steam slash tags. It does a great job of this. And basically what you can do is you can look for every tag that's on Steam, and these are basically genres, and it breaks down and it shows you games that, uh, uh, what the zero to 5K, like how many, what percentage of games make that, all the way up to a million dollars. And you can kind of see like what type of games are here from this. And if you click on the genre tag like that, you get a list of all games ranked from highest net revenue all the way down to the least. And what I like to do is just scroll, scroll, scroll until I find games that kind of are in my, you know, potential range. So for instance, uh, when I looked at roguelike games, I could see that a 5,000 earner game was the Shields of Legacy. Uh, loyalty, sorry. Uh, at the 25k range, Dungeons of Chaos, and at the 100k, it's this uh, Lovecraft's Untold Stories. So I can kind of break down what these charts are telling me, right? And then I can also look for games that look really good, but maybe underperformed what they should have. And then games that like don't look great, but they very, did a lot of money. They really earned a lot. And what you're trying to do is just trying to sense the market. What does a, a game that underperforms look like? And what does a game that overperforms look like? Because you're trying to figure out if there's some, some secret thing that you're not doing in your game that's going to trip you up. And if you don't include that special feature, you could end up earning much less than you expect. That's what you're trying to do. You should be focusing on the games that your team can actually make. Don't lie to yourself. Don't say, well, we could make this really, really complicated game. If your team can't make it, you know, really assess. Be honest with yourself. Okay, so you've determined what the viable genre looks like. You've seen what kind of games are in that genre. And now it's time to see what the fans like of these games. Here's what we're going to do. We found a bunch of games. In that previous exercise, we identified games that maybe earned a little less than they should have, or maybe a game that overperformed and did much better. Your job now is to figure out why. Why did these games either underperform or overperform? So I like to keep a list of all the games that I kind of am targeting. Six to 10 are great. If you go too many, you just can't do the deep dive that you need to do. So let's just pick six games that are along that earning spectrum. And we're gonna read reviews for all these six games that we just picked out. We're gonna figure out why the fans like some of them and why they hate other ones. The way we're gonna do it is we're just gonna look at the, at the reviews and pick out keywords. So for instance, I've pulled some reviews from some visual novel games. And these are actual reviews from Steam that I've pulled. And you'll notice this is from one game. And you'll see the reviews have the same thing popping up over and over. Visual novels that allow me to skip through dialogue. I wish it had that. You'll have to wait through all the dialogue again. It's frustrating to see that there's no option to skip fast forward through the dialogue. So this game that I pulled these three reviews, these are three separate reviews, kept coming up with the same problem and over and over again. The game does not allow you to skip through previous dialogue. That's a very important thing for these fans. And that is probably one of the main reasons the game that I'm studying didn't perform as well as it could have. Now, the other way you can do it is go to YouTube or some other video streaming service and look at Let's Plays to see what fans are saying. See what topics come up over and over. You want to listen to what real fans are saying. For instance, here's some comments. Somebody was saying, I was just searching for a run and gun roguelike. This looks good. I like that comment that that person left because it tells me this genre, run and gun roguelike. It tells me some things that fans know more than I do. I should do some more research on this run and gun roguelike. Some people also mention other games like this game, Hell Yeah, uh, said best looking jump and gun since Hell Yeah. So some mediocre roguelike with a lot of bad design decisions. Fun gameplay though. 
as you can see by looking at what the fans are saying, you get a sense that they know a lot about the genre that you don't. And so you should really look into the games that they're talking about. So what I like to do is I open up a spreadsheet and I take all the reviews that I've read and copied out of, and I just put them on this chart. On the left-hand side, I write down everything that fans keep saying are bad over and over again. On the right, I write down all the things that I think fans like. They kept saying, this is great, I love this. And then I have a clear catalog of what I should be worried about. For example, when you listen to fans of visual novels, you'll hear them call this thing called a CG, which stands for computer graphics. This dates back to the early days of visual novels, which are a romantic kiss. At the end of a visual novel, fans expect there to be a CG of the main characters in the romantic relationship consummating the relationship. It's an important thing. I went to reviews of a game that did not have any CGs, and you can see the fans are very disappointed. The reviews say, it couldn't come out a bit smoothly with CGs. There are no CGs, not a single one. I'm so heartbroken. How can you deny me an Anders Kiss CG? So here we are, we're seeing fans really want the CGs. If you didn't do this research, you might not realize how much fans want this. Other genres like um, um, hidden object games, a lot of the sh uh, players really hate spiders. And you'll notice that if you go to forums, a lot of people are asking whether the games have spiders in them. This is an important thing to know because if you're making a hidden object game, you don't want to put spiders in your game. It makes the feeling, it makes the players uncomfortable. You need to understand the player base for the genre you're making. It is important to do that and you need to review what people are saying about the game. Now, all of this comes down to uh, two parts of a game. One is the hook. The hook is a combination of features that make your game unique. It's what makes your game stand out. That's what a hook is. For example, here are games with great hooks. Um, this is called Super Hot on the left. The hook for this game is Time Only Moves When You Move. The other one is Untitled Goose Game. You're a goose. That's a hook on itself. Now, something that's not a hook is that you can shoot again, a gun, because Let's be honest, most video games have guns in them. So that's not a hook to say, oh, you can shoot a gun. Nobody really cares. So that would not be a hook. A hook has to make your game unique. Now on the other side are what I call anchors. Anchors are the combination of features that make your game familiar, recognizable, comfortable. These are things like the CGs that I was just talking about. Fans of visual novels expect there to be CGs. It's an anchor of the genre. Similarly, that other review where people were expecting to be able to skip dialogue through your visual novel, that is an anchor. It's a feature that you need to put in your visual novel if you're making one because the fans expect it. Now, this all comes up, this hook and anchor, when it comes to your capsule images. Now, capsule images are on Steam. They're the sort of front page. They're the first thing players are gonna see when they're shopping for games. And your game has to represent itself in an instant. People just browse through Steam so quickly. Now, you'll notice these capsule images have very similar traits to them. All, both of these are in the two different genres, but Shop Titans and Idle Cliff Clicker are both crafting games. And you'll notice they have hammers in both of these capsule images. That hook, hammer indicates to fans that this is a crafting game. It's a subtle clue. It's an anchor. It's something that teaches them that this is a crafting game. And fans of that genre have just learned that that's important to them. By the same token, simulator games have a very specific graphic design style. Sans serif font that is white, and then you show the vehicle that you're simulating on the right-hand side, and you kind of put the, the bold text on top of it. That's just an anchor of the design of the capsule images for simulator games. By doing this, this actually tells fans, I am a simulator, and fans are more like fans of simulators are more likely to click on your image. You need to understand your genre and what the, the anchors are. So hooks are what make your game unique, anchors are what make it familiar. And you can only determine these if you play a lot of games in your genre that you're making your game for. You need to study your genre. So learn about the audience, do your homework. I'm giving you free permission to go study as many games and play as many games as you want. So you might be thinking that you're an Indian, you have to be as crazy as possible and be so unique and throw away every genre. 
That's not quite true. There's this um, psychological uh, phenomenon called the mere exposure effect. People prefer things that are more familiar with. It's also called the familiarity principle because it's built on the establishment of familiarity people. People like things that are familiar, but just a little bit different. And that's the combination of hooks and anchors. This is a great comic. I love this uh, comic. It kind of shows uh, what people are saying. This is an artist on the left hand saying, holding up a green thing that says original. And then uh, nobody really cares. But then this artist pulls up two things. One is a popular and a popular thing, and then he mashes them together, and the crowd goes wild. That's very true. Fans want to see two familiar things twisted together, and that is what really makes people uh, really love a product. So part three of my system for analyzing the market is to see what your competition does. I'm going to show you how. Now, you might be a fan of Blizzard. I'm a fan of Blizzard. Um, and if you're marketing your game, you might think, well, I'm going to do what Blizzard does. And when Blizzard was releasing uh, Overwatch, they went down to Sydney, Australia, and they had some artists paint a mural of Overwatch. I'm going to tell you, don't go to Sydney to paint a mural to promote your game. It's not going to work. Or even do a mural in your own town. That was not the reason Overwatch was successful for Blizzard. Let me tell you, Blizzard is a publicly traded company. You are an indie. You are at a different league than Blizzard. You have to do what your own scale will allow you to do. Don't just follow the big guys because they're your favorites. Follow companies that are about your size. So, for instance, on Steam, Steam runs on wish lists. The more wish lists you have at launch, the better your game will do. That's just how the market works on Steam. And you might be asking me, well, how many wish lists do you need? Well, you do the research, and I'm going to show you how. Now, there's this website called steamdb.info, and it categorizes Steam. It just, it's a bot that scrolls through Steam every day and collects information about every game that's on Steam. And you can search for any game that has released or is about to release on Steam and see a bunch of stats for it. And it's very helpful when you're researching other games. One of the things that SteamDB does is it keeps track of this value called a follower. Now, wish lists are not publicly information, publicly available information. It's information that only you can see if you are uh, the owner of the game. However, followers is a very public number. And SteamDB keeps track of followers every day. And you can see a history for any game that has a publicly available Steam page and see all the followers for that game. So for instance, it even tells you when the game released. You see that little REL? That indicates that the game has released at this point, which is very helpful because you can see, based on the chart, how many followers the game had at launch. That's very helpful for you because one follower is a about 10 wish lists. So for some games, it's about nine, some games it's more, but on average, you can calculate that one follower equals 10 wish lists. Now, so let's say I'm doing a research on roguelikes. I can look up Atlas Rogues, this randomly game that I found, on steamdb.info. When I look at it, I can see when they launched, they had 288 followers. So I do the math multiply it by 10, I can tell roughly that this game launched with 2,880 followers. Now, that I write that down in my research journal here. And that kind of gives me an idea of how big the following is for that game. And what you want to do is, remember that those six games that we identified that we're going to be following? You go look up for every single one of those how many wish lists those games had when they launched and see if there's any correlation between the low performers and the high performers. That'll really tell you what kind of performance it had when it launched. So once you kind of get that range, you have a launch goal. You can say, hey, these games that really did well, they had this number of followers and do the math, this many wish lists when we launched. Now you know what your goal is when it comes time to launch your game. It really helps to kind of see what the expectations are for the market, okay? Now, you might be wondering, okay, well, how did they get all those wish lists? What should I be doing? What activities should be taking in order to get the numbers that that competition that I'm looking at did? Let me show you. The cool thing about the follower chart on SteamDB is they keep track of every single day how many followers it had. 
and you can look specifically at these little spikes of activity. You'll notice that the graph kind of rises in giant step patterns. That indicates that a major marketing activity happened anytime you see those jumps in follower counts. And what you can do is pinpoint when those are and do the research. So if you're wondering, hey, does TikTok work? Let's investigate. So we're gonna just pick for this random game that I found on SteamDB, a little spike. You'll notice it kind of bumped up a little bit right there at the beginning, I underlined it here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the date. So on this case, it was February 28th, 2020. We're gonna go and we're gonna do some research. We're gonna start with their Steam page. And if you click on the game that I was just looking at on their Steam page, there's a button on the top right called Community Hub. You click that, then you click the News tab, and you can see a list of all the news events. Often, when games are in a major event or doing a major marketing push, they will actually uh, post news about what they're doing at that time on their news page. In this case, I can see one was posted June 22nd, but I don't see one that was on that February 28th time period, so that doesn't help us. Sometimes you get lucky and you see it there, but not always, but that's where I always start. So let's keep looking. One thing I always do is use twitter.com slash advanced search, or search advanced. This is a tool that Twitter uses and other social media networks have very similar tools where you can search for date ranges. Now what I do typically is I look for the developer's Twitter account. I also look for their publisher's Twitter account if they have a publisher. And I type those um, Twitter accounts in the search box and then I limit the days. Now you'll notice we're looking for February 28th when that spike happened. I like to do a few days before and a few days after just to kind of make sure I didn't miss anything. Sometimes people are early or late with their tweets. My goal here is to figure out if any tweets hint at what they did at that time period. So search their Twitter handle, search their publisher's Twitter handle, and then you'll see this tweet. I found this one, February 28th, the publisher of this game that I'm looking at tweeted, hey, it's time for PAX East. It's day two of PAX East. Obviously, the person who uh, got this uh, spike in traffic was part of PAX East. So now I can see, hey, conferences like PAX East actually do help move numbers. Maybe we should invest in looking into joining PAX East. It's gonna be different for every game, but you need to analyze what events did these kind of great growth of numbers for their games. So this will also tell you <clears throat> because you now know the follower conversion rate, whether you should pay money for a festival. Because sometimes festivals have money that you have to pay in order to get into them. I can see by looking at the follower count before and then after the festival, and then multiplying it by 10, that the, they probably gained about 1,500 wish lists during this festival. Then once you know the wish list gro growth, you can go and identify, hey, is it worth it to us to pay $1,000 for this festival? It's up to you. You now have a scale of what to expect. Now, you might not know where the spike came from. You, Twitter might not help you out. Here are some other places that typically cause big spikes. Look on Reddit to see if any post went viral there. Look on YouTube. Look on Imager. Look at all those places. They typically coincide with a spike in wish lists. Those are big drivers of huge spikes of wish lists. So check those out. They might be worth it. Now, the other way that you need to look at how your competition is marketing its game is their daily organic growth rate. Now, a lot of times people aren't running big promotions like being in a festival. They're just slowly growing based on the organic traffic that Steam gives you. Now, what you can do to identify this is look at these long, boring periods. Here's Steam B DB chart again, and this one is a slow, flat zone, but you can see it's slightly increasing. We're gonna detect how many wish lists that got. Some genres grow very fast, even if you're not doing an active promotion. Other genres are pretty flat. So let's take a look. What you need to do is go down to your target games on SteamDB, and there's this little button above the graph that has a little download arrow. Click that button, and you're gonna get a, a CSV chart of every day and how many followers. What I do is I import that into a spreadsheet tool like Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel, and I just look and I do a daily change. I just do a delta from one day to the next to see how many wish lists they earn on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I take a week, you know, seven days, maybe 14 days, and I just average that delta. That'll give you the daily average growth rate. 
by getting that average growth rate, you can identify how many wish lists they have. So in this case, this game earned three wish lists, or actually, I'm sorry, three followers per day on average. Now, we know that time multiply followers by 10, you can see that this game earns about 30 wish lists a day. Now, if you are trying to match their marketing performance to have the same goal, you can see like, okay, our game should be getting 30 wish lists a day. Are you? Are you earning 30 wish lists? It might be important to do more community outreach, improve your Steam page, uh, figure out how other places are kind of sharing their game. All these things are ways to know whether you're on the right track or the wrong track when promoting your game. So that is exactly what I'm looking at when I'm trying to promote my games. If you have any questions for me, howtomarketagame.com slash free is my, my weekly newsletter. I send out information about how to trace your game, how to improve your numbers, um, really trends and how to get those giant spikes. If you go over to my other page, howtomakeasteampage.com, I give you step-by-step -step tutorial on how to make your Steam page using best practices. By doing this, you're gonna actually increase your daily organic without even having to do anything. You don't have to do any day-to-day -day promotion. Steam will just naturally expose your game more if you use best practices. And in this course right here, howtomakeasteampage.com, which is free, um, I teach you how to do that. If you have more questions that I didn't answer or anything, I'm gonna be doing a Q&A. But if you are not watching this live or you aren't able to attend this Q&A, I do have a Twitter account at, at Adventure Mountain. You can ask me anything there, and that's the best place to reach me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, Chris. Hi. And uh, thank you for the, um, uh, the amazing talk. And then we are going to jump right into the Q&A part. And we already have a few audience questions. And uh, I will try to like alternate audience questions and mine questions. Okay. Great, great, thank you so much. Okay, um, so, okay, first one, uh, which uh, of all the like marketing campaigns or like game marketing uh, methods that you've seen before, which, do you have like one or two uh, cases that you, like you have like so impressed what they, what they did? Do you have any example that you can give? Yeah, there are two that I think um, are very good. One is um, uh, Valheim. Uh, it's a very popular game in the U.S. and I think worldwide they've sold millions of copies. Uh, one thing that I think they did very well was they started small um, and they actually just uh, did small alpha and beta tests. And then from there, they kind of altered the game following along with the community to see what the community really liked. So I think that was a really smart thing that they've done. Mm -hmm. Another great game that I really like to follow is another Steam game. And um, this is from a Polish developer, and the game is called Riftbreaker. And they've okay. just done a great campaign. It hasn't released yet, but they have constantly are in festivals, posting on Reddit. Uh, they're really engaging with the community. They have a Twitch screen, stream every week. So they're really good at engaging with the community, and it's the right type of game for the Steam audience. So I think they've really got a good grasp of what the Steam audience likes to see. So uh, those are two games that I would recommend following, looking at how they've done marketing. OK, great. I will translate that uh, roughly. So the answer of the question is that the question is that he has a particular impression of the game. He has two examples. Actually, it's quite a recent example. One is Valheim. Valheim is actually on Steam. It's actually very popular for the past few years. You should have heard or played it. Valheim's method is that they have done a very lot of 它是 close alpha， 然后 open alpha， 然后再 beta， 他们一路用各种试玩跟 alpha、beta 的版本这样一一路推出来，其实推了好长一段时间。那我记得，呃，讲师其实他有一篇文章专门在分析 Valheim 的这个过程。然后另外一款他很有印象的是，呃， Rift Breaker。Rift Breaker 它的呃行销方式其实很值得大家参考，特别他们呃每一周都有一个就是游戏的直播。然后到现在好像都是还没有正式推出的状态，但是它就是有一直在推广。然后刚好 Rift Re 呃 Rift Breaker 这款游戏，它的这个受众也很适合 Steam 的这个族群哦，所以这两款游戏可以推荐大家去关注一下他们实际上在行销还有社群运作上的一些方式。OK， let's uh get to the next question. How do you 
how do you do uh, the, anal the analysis process that you describe in your talk for mixed genre games? Yeah, for mixed genre games, it's an excellent question. Um, what I like to do is play the game and find out what the core genre is. Usually mixed genre games have one that is very central, mm -hmm. and then the second one is kind of uh, added almost like spice to the, to the product. Mm -hmm. But if the product is directly 50-50, two different genres, I like to test marketing with one genre and then test marketing with the other genre, you know, maybe month to month, week to week, just to see which one connects better with the audience. Mm -hmm. Got it. 呃，那讲师刚刚对这个问题的回答是，我、哦、也是也是想重复一下问题哦。那那个问题是说，呃，对于就是混合类型的游戏，那呃应该要怎么样来做这个呃市场分析、市场调查之类的？那讲师刚回应是说，呃，对于混合类型的游戏，它一定都还是会有一个主类型，然后另外它的两三个呃特征或是分类，可能是属于比较像是配菜那种感觉。那你要先把这个主类型抓出来。那另外就是说，在你做相关的市场呃操作或者说市场分析的时候，你就是会需要两，就是假设它是它有两个特别重要的类型分类，那你就是呃两边你都要各做一次，两种类型都要各做一次，然后看哪一种是比较符合你目前在做的这个对象。就是也许你这个游戏是，比如说 RPS。呃，这个 RTS 加加这个 RPG， 好，假设是这种混合，那你要做哪一个方向？你就是两边可能都要试试看看。对 ，OK， 呃、uh, ，Next question. So when a I think this this comes out a lot, and, and you you definitely have、uh, replied this before in in other occasions. So the question is, when a indie studio that just you know just they just established themselves, they just came out and making their first game, how do they go about you know doing marketing? Um, how should they do marketing? Yeah, or how, they, how, how do they typically do marketing? <laughs> yeah, how should they do marketing? Yeah, I think、um, the big things that 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 really have an impact are festivals.、Mm -hmm. So.、Um, You can apply to、uh, keep keep up with festivals that are on the internet.、Um, I, I search, you know,、uh, blogs or social media for upcoming festivals, and these festivals are like,、um, you know,、uh, Steam Next Festival.、Um, uh, other organizations put on these festivals on Steam. That is a great way to get lots of visibility for your game.、Mm -hmm. That's one.、Um, the other one is.、Um, Reaching out to some of these social platforms、um, and just kind of building a community. Make sure that they always have the call to action to go wish list your game, because what you want to do is over time build the wish list for Steam. Don't release your game unless you have a lot of wish lists.、Um, I mentioned in my talk、mm -hmm. that I like to look at my competition to see what the number of wish lists that they launch with. It is very important to build a long campaign. Don't just release your game too early. It's and you should start marketing early. Okay, thank you. I'll translate that. 呃，所以刚刚这个问题是说，那对于没有名气、刚开始做的工作是要怎么样做？开始做行销这样。那第一点，他直接建议就是去找各种呃，以现在来讲的话，可能就是各种线上的呃展会可以参与的。那最好是，譬如说都跟 Steam 有关的，譬如说呃，上个月才进行过了 Steam 新品节，像这样子的东西。对于你就算是没有呃。背景，或是说没有没有过去记录的这些新团队，如果你的游戏还不错的话，在这种地方都还是有记得，呃，有蛮高的机会获得一定程度的曝光，跟收到一些就是譬如说愿望清单之类的回馈。那再来一个很重要的就是，你应该要去呃尽早的开始做自己的 Steam， 在 Steam 上面要尽早做就是愿望清单的收集。那要做的方式就是说，你必须要尽快的开你的游戏页面。好，那。昨天其实有其他的演讲提到，游戏面要好好做嘛，我觉得尽早开，但是还是要好好做，然后想办法收集愿望清单。那务必要调查清楚，你这类的游戏理论上在发售前应该大概要多少愿望清单？你不要就是呃这个页面一开，然后就马上隔两个礼拜就开卖，就这样子的效果一定会很差。就务必记得要花比较多时间在经营的愿望清单，然后建立社群关系，然后。
要到达好的愿望清单数字的时候，才真的去做游戏的发售。OK， 嗯、um, ，Next question。Okay, this is uh, interesting. Um, so we we use uh, the review count on Steam now to estimate the uh, the sales count, right? So, is there any other formula that you can use for? Oh no, I, I think the question is how do you use wish list to roughly at uh, estimate your your maybe you know. Sales count at launch, something like that. Yes,、um, typically when you launch your game, and it depends on the quality of your game and how the reviews, the early reviews are. But we expect that ten to twenty percent of your wish lists will convert within the first week、mm -hmm. of your sale of your game launching. Okay. 那这个题目呃，应该算是比较直接可以回答，就是说呃。用 review 可以去观察已经发售游戏的这个销售数量。那如果用愿望清单要怎么计算，就是游戏首发时候的销售数量这样。哦，那大概呃，不同游戏跟不同呃品质，就是你手周的这个游戏的玩家反应好不好，这件事情当然会有影响。哦，但是平均来说的话，大约发售前的十趴到二十趴的这个愿望清单数字会转换成。就是你的游戏手周的销量，就这个大概是可以去预估的转换率。OK， next question， 嗯、um, ，Let's see， Do you think the are are there any marketing strategy or marketing actions that people should just not do？ They're bad marketing kind of. <laughs> um, I think that um bad marketing. I kind of alluded to it. I I think in person marketing、uh -huh. doesn't work as well because it's not very time effective. In other words, what? Sorry, if you are. In a in person, at a, you know, at a festival or something, I just don't think it it works as well. Like in a in person, I mean, we can't do it right now because of the、uh, the, the state of the world right now. But I think that the it doesn't scale well enough.、Um, so going person to person, just it it takes too long and it's too hard to do.、Um, mm -hmm. So I think that. But really, I like to have the mentality of try small experiments and see if they work. And if they don't work. Try something else.、Um, I think that is、uh, the better approach. Just to to keep your eyes open, try a lot of things, and then、uh, keep doing the things that work very well.、Mm -hmm. Or or maybe I can、uh, follow it up by asking: Is there anything that you should not even try in terms of marketing? Um, maybe. Print ads or bus <laughs> bus ads? I don't know. Okay, I don't、yeah. think those work too well. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Okay. 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 I got it. 对，那这问题是说，就是问说有没有哪些行销行为是最好不要做或是不能做的？好，那呃，就是其实这个问题好像就是不是很容易回答。那讲师刚刚是有提到说，就是呃，就是。那种实体展会上的那一种类型的行销，通常会。比想象中的更没有效益，对。然后，呃，另外举例的话，就是刚刚有提到说，就最后提到说，可能不要去，就是如果你是独立开发者的话，不要去买什么什么看板广告啊、公车广告之类的，就是那个应该是没有对你来讲可能没有什么效果，或者可能也你也买不起之类的。对。I I had one more idea. Right. Okay. One one problem that I see a lot of early indies do, and a lot of other indies, are they market to other game developers?、Mm -hmm. They hang out in marketplaces or social media where a bunch of other developers、mm -hmm. are, and they end up marketing to developers and not to fans.、Uh -huh. And that's why I teach this research to figure out who are your fans, where do they live, what works and what doesn't, so that you don't accidentally market just to developers. Okay, actually, that, that, yeah, that is a very good point. 呃，对，那刚刚讲师补充一段，就是说你在行销的时候，就是尽量要注意说你在推销的对象到底是哪一个族群。很多时候，第一就是第一做，第二做，刚开始
开发的这种独立开发者，很容易不小心只推销给其他独立开发者。哦，就是重点其实是你最后是要接触你真正的玩家群、真正的市场，而不是只是接触同温层或者同号。OK， OK。Okay, I think this is fairly interesting as well.、Um, if there are not that many game ideas or game genres that you really want to dabble in, you know, as a developer, then because you you in your talk you mentioned that you know you should have like hundreds or even thousands of ideas, and then you pick the ones that actually work, you know, in the market、uh, that are actually viable. But if you just you you just pretty adamant about like I just want to make these three games, these two games, and it, somehow if they, if they don't fit, how you know how do we do? <laughs> what what do we do? Okay, here's the thing: is、um, I think you should still make it. I I don't want to turn any like this should be fun. This is one of the most fun industries. Otherwise, <laughs> we would be making bank software or something, right? right?、Uh, software for boring <laughs> companies. We、yeah. don't like to do that. So my advice is. Understand the market and budget your time and how much you invest in it based on the expected results. So, if you don't think this genre is going to sell as well as another one, estimate and then scope your project to fit that.、Mm-hmm. Now, if it and then release, and if it does better than you expected, then make a sequel. Keep keep building on that genre, but just don't spend a lot of time and a lot of money on a genre that might not sell very well. Okay, that, yeah, this.、Uh... Makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I'll I'll translate that. Um, 就讲师刚的回答，就针对这个问题的回答是说，就是哦，不好意思，也重复一下问题。就问题是说，呃，如果你自己其实并没有真的有什么几十个、几百种想游戏想法，然后这些这么多游戏类型你想要尝试的话，你就是只想做特定几个类型。那假设那几个类型又没有办法像今天讲师提到这些内容，你去这样子做分析，那该怎么办？好，那讲师的讲讲话，讲师的回应是说，其实你也不要太灰心，就是说，哦，就是感觉好像就是劝退，就不要做游戏了，这样也不是这个意思，而是你还是想办法用呃刚刚提到的这些方案去做市场调查跟分析。那你可以抓出一个你这样子的游戏，用你现有的人力或者是资源能够做到的程度是多少，你应该要去预估出来。那你有那个预估之后，再回头过来。想办法去把你想要做的游戏做出来，所以就算你的游戏类型可能非常竞争，或者是说这个游戏类型在 Steam 上可能根本不会卖，但是它一定还是会有一个预估值可以做出来。那你就去想办法在那个限制之下，把你想要做的游戏做完。对，那这个是他的建议，那我觉得也是很有道理，就是用市场的状况去回推你想要做的东西。好 ，OK， let's find the next question. Um， let's see. Okay, this is interesting. So there, there's actually a lot of、uh, there are a lot of、uh, free to play games on Steam even now. So when you do this kind of analysis, do you actually skip the games that are free to play, or do you actually look all of them? Look, look at all of them. Yes,、um, the analysis that I do,、uh, I I market paid games. I I I don't know the free to play market on Steam.、Mm-hmm. I just don't know it. Um, my analysis does not do free to play. Okay.、Um, I think it's harder to to get that data out. I I just don't、mm-hmm. know. So I don't do free free to play. So I can't I can't answer that very well. But I I take out free to play data. Okay. I think this is a very good point to 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 qual、uh, to to、uh, clarify. Yeah. So because free to play can make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 对，那讲师刚的这个回应这个问题是说，就是如果你在做这样的 Steam 分析的时候，要不要去管这个免费游戏？那讲师有强调说，他今天提到这个内容是不适用于 Steam 上的 Free to Play 游戏，那就更不要讲 Steam 以外平台的的 Free to Play， 就是基本上 Free to Play 是不在这样子的市场分析的方案之中的哈。那因为基本上他们营收的获取方式跟付费游戏其实是差非常远的哦，所以就是要做一点澄清这样。OK， next question， 嗯、um,。Uh, when you are about to release your game, and then you realize that the wish list is just not there, the wish list count is just not there, and then you have some, you know, uh, you, you, your your budget is running out, your funding is running out. 
how do you actually like salvage that situation? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's it's hard. I I feel for you. I, I've been on that side myself. My feeling is some games just when uh, games kind of have a spirit, and I don't think ch- you can't change it too much. In other words, you can't take a game and if you just add another level, that's going to do it, and it's all of a sudden going to have wishes. What I recommend is um, tie things up, release them. You know, maybe try a couple marketing things, but. If you don't see the numbers increase quite a bit, you know, I talked about the daily wish list rate. If you can't get that to increase and your your wish list just aren't gonna meet your targets, it probably means you just need to work on your game. <laughs> In other words, like it, your game just isn't fun. I, I, I and I'll be honest. Um, and sometimes what you do is you release, you you take a lot of lessons, and you build your next game. Um, and you you learn from from the game that just didn't get a lot of wish lists. Mm. I I think that that's not a bad thing. You should learn from maybe the game didn't sell well. That's okay. You just learn and your next game will be better and you learn your next game will be better and get feedback from the community about why they like it or they don't or just don't care about your game. So move on, release, better next time. <laughs> I, so I think maybe the another good uh, tie-in response would be always always have the the preparation you know to to f- you, you o- you're always prepared to fail and you always are expected to make the next game right so the, the, that that should be your mindset going in okay the other one other point to that mm-hmm. is if this is your first game you're not going to do very well because there's so many developers on steam that the press fans they ignore you until you get your first game out because a lot of people never finish their game Mm -hmm. so fans don't get too excited about games because they've been let down before Mm -hmm. so once you've released your first game people are more receptive to you they're gonna say ah i know that developer their last game wasn't great but i trust them for their next game they're gonna do good Mm -hmm. so i'd say it's not a bad thing to release a game that doesn't do you know huge numbers it's Mm -hmm. okay okay good good response 那刚刚这个问题是说就是假设你在游戏发售前就是资金已经快烧完了然后你的刚刚清单又没有达到预期的目标要怎么办那但重点就是说有时候你的游戏可能就是做到快要发售前那也许品质或者说可玩性就真的
like those games because of what they said. Like, like when you are reading the, you know, you're calling a lot of Steam reviews, right? So how do you actually make sure that's, you know, that's really the case? Yeah, I, I trust the reviews. I, I mean, they, people say that people are honest on a review. I mean, mm -hmm. they, if anything, they might be a little harsh. And that's why I like to look at a lot of reviews because I like to see if there's common trends. And, you know, I, I mentioned that um, if uh, I showed a couple examples where I saw the same comments coming up over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And if, it, if there's merit to that, like if it's right, like for instance, I was talking about how, um, you know, you couldn't skip dialogue in that um, visual novel mm -hmm. game. If you see that multiple times, that's probably an indicator that they really do care about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what I, I go as if I just see one comment that's outside of the norm, mm -hmm. eh, I'll kind of ignore it. But if I see two or three, mm -hmm. I know to pay attention to that. Okay. So yes, I, I just look for frequency. A very good point. 对，那这问题是说，就是你在做这个市场分析的时候，要如何确定这个客群是真的哦、呃，他是因为那些原因去喜欢或是讨厌某一款游戏、某些要素这样子。那呃，江浙的回应是说，基本上就是看频率。当然，有时候如果说只有一两个人偶尔提到，那也许他讲的跟他真的心中想的，或者是说跟市场平均来说，也许是相关性可能不高。但是你就是看频率，假设某一个点好的地方，或是不管是好或是坏的地方，他被重复的提到很多次，那大概就是真的是那个原因。对，所以其实就是看频率这样。Let me check. Well, we we are getting a lot of questions now. <laughs> the the list is pretty long. Um, how do you decide, like, what, uh, what what is your target wish list count? Um, as I mentioned in the talk, mm -hmm. I and I think this is a good good way of doing it is looking at games that are about my comparable with my game in other mm -hmm. words quality level complexity level mm -hmm. uh graphical style level you know if you're making a 2d game and your competition i would not compare myself to 3d games mm -hmm. I, again tr this is and this is more art than science you just gotta find the game that you think matches you mm -hmm. and kind of see what range of wish lists they got right um right. but in general i try and get at least 10,000 wish lists or mm -hmm. for my clients, I try and recommend 10,000 wish lists mm -hmm. just because the Steam algorithm is scaled to games about that size right. when you launch. It's not doesn't mean you're going to do very well, but 10,000 is kind of the minimum mm -hmm. where Steam starts to pay attention to you and right. promote your game. That's not a guarantee. It still has to sell well. But again, I say that 10,000 is the minimum if you want to make it very commercial. Okay, got it. 呃，对，那刚刚问题是说，就是呃，你没有经验的话，你要怎么样去定你，或者说你你不确定你的游戏到底应该要多少 wish list 才适合上架这样？那有两个面向，第一个是说，就是呃，其实这个在演讲中就有提到，就是找自己类型，然后哎，属于你这个游戏的类型，然后找适合就是类似量级的游戏去比较，然后看那些游戏。就是它的销售量好不好？如果你觉得那些游戏销售量不好，然后你看它的愿望清单表现确实也蛮差的，那表示你要做的愿望清单数是一定是比那个高嘛？哦，那你就是去想办法去多找几个参考点。对，那另外一个算是比较相就是比较绝对的标准，就是这是跟 Steam 的演算法有关。这应该也是很多开发者在私下讨论之后归纳出来的一个数字，就是 Steam 大概要一万个愿望清单才会真正有，就是呃。帮你做一些演算法上的推广，哦，所以，呃，无论如何，不管你是做怎样类型游戏，你应该至少都要，呃，瞄准就是一万的一万个愿望清单以上。如果你的愿望清单数连一万都不到的话，那就是要呃再三考虑。OK， 再三考虑。OK， I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so this one is, uh, how do you? How do you determine the length of your of your marketing campaign? Like, how how do you not do that for too long, and then you know maybe several years later people are already you know 
lot lose their interest. Yeah, I recommend at least a year. I mean, I think year is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not at least um, a year is a, is a good time frame. Okay. Um, but eighteen months, a year and a half is okay too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like like I said, that game Valheim was in development for a very long time, yeah. eighteen months. Steam and the Valve has recommend said longer campaigns actually do better. Um, mm -hmm. People will stick with you if your game is good. Um, but I would say eighteen months to six months. That is kind of the sweet spot for marketing time. It, mm -hmm. Less than six months, you just don't have time to gather enough wish lists. It's just for what you need. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no, there isn't too much of a penalty for going long. Right. Okay. Got it. 哦，那刚刚问题就是说要怎样去抓那个宣传期的长度，然后可能提问者的想法是说他怕宣传期太长这样。好，那其实讲者刚刚的回应是，就是大概以一年为基准去抓的话是蛮好的，就是呃再短的话，也许最短到大约六个月，那长一点的话，其实到十八个月、一年半，其实也都没有问题哈。那呃，就是尽量不要在短于六个月去去做这个游戏的发售，因为你如果只有上架不到，就是你的你的这个 Steam 页面开张不到六个月，哦，可能在两三个月你就上的话，其实你是没有办法累积到那一个呃愿望清单数字的。OK， so let's do our last question. Um, so usually when we launch games on Steam, usually it's like global launch. Usually, and but but we also know Steam has regional pricing now, right? So, uh, when you do marketing, do you pay attention to like regional differences because of, you know, basically the paying customers they have different value, you know, in terms of you know the regional pricing. Yes, you can get in there and change the values, mm -hmm. but. Steam knows the market better than I do as far as currency and what the market wants. Mm -hmm. Steam has much more data than I do. Mm -hmm. So when you put your game in, Steam will automatically convert your price to mm -hmm. a, very, a whole lot of territories. Mm -hmm. I trust Steam. But if you know, maybe you grew up in a different country and you know that country has a specific things, go for it. Mm -hmm. I just don't have time to do regional pricing. I just let Steam, mm -hmm. I, I trust Steam on that regard. So I. Mm -hmm. That's my recommendation. Uh, but I mean, rather, uh, the, the question is probably not about how do you set a price, but ab about do you pay attention to, say, be, do you t pay attention to US more because of the regional pricing, because they pay more, basically? Uh, um, not necessarily. I mean, yeah. some, some countries really like certain games. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for instance, translation is a big thing, too. Mm -hmm. I think that's, a, that's the biggest question as far as regionally yeah. is the translations mm -hmm. um and so i would i would translate it into all the companies and you can actually check on steam um if you go into your steamworks you can check at your wish lists it's it's a, i think it's under sales but even though you're checking wish lists, go to sales mm -hmm. check wish list and it'll give you a pie chart of what countries are wish listing your game mm -hmm. and you can maybe spend money to translate to a country that is overrepresented that means they like your game a lot so mm -hmm. I would look into that to see if there's a country that maybe you should translate to. Maybe you should put a little effort into marketing there. Okay, that's a, that's a very very good suggestion. Um, 那刚刚的问题是说，就是呃，就是在做呃市场调查的时候，会不会比如说特别关注美国区，或者说那个就是在分区定价上面那个定价，这个建议定价通常最高的那个地区这样。好，那呃，刚刚讲者的回应是说不见得哦，其实你要看你自己游戏的特性。那在 Steam 的后台，你如果去观察你的那个愿望清单的来源的话，其实你是有办法看到不同国家地区的来源的。那你你如果会发现说，哎、欸，有一些地假假设，比如说你只做了英文版跟中文版，可是就是代就代表说你的游戏应该在英文版跟中文版地区以外的这个愿望清单比例应该要相对很低。但是假设你有一个很独特的，比如哎、欸，我明明根本没有做二文版，可是我的。二文区的愿望清单来源居然比例比想象中的高很多，那其实代表这个时候你是多一个选择，就是说你应该要去呃考虑制作二文版，因为
这样的话，你可以去把你在二文区那边的支持者的数量再往上更更推升。对，那这个是一个呃蛮值得关注的议题，就是用这种方式去了解说你在发售前或是游戏发售后马上就要做的额外的语言版本要怎么做。OK。Actually, there's a very good question I I I, I kind of missed, so I think I we will end on this okay. this one. Um, so the the ten thousand wish list that we talk about, you know, the the bare minimum, does that amount also apply when you do early access? Yes, it okay. does. Um, early access is your launch. Um, you only get one launch on Steam, so whether it's early access or full. It counts the same. So a lot of I've I've worked with a lot of developers who've made this mistake. Don't make this mistake. Right. Early access is your launch. It should be a big thing. A lot of people think it's a soft launch. Mm -hmm. It is not, not a soft launch on yeah. Steam. Be careful with early access. Oh, you got to have that ten thousand for early access launch. Okay. Thank you very much. I think th this is a very good point to end on.、Uh, so I'll translate that, and then、uh, we'll end. 那刚刚这个问题，我觉得就是因为刚 miss 掉，不好不好意思哦。就是上架累积到一万一万清单，这个是指正式上架，还是抢先体验可以不用管这个这个原则？哦，那刚刚讲师的回应就是说不对，就是用万清单，不论你是抢先体验还是正式上架，你就是应该至少要累积到一万。就是你在 Steam 上，简单的说，抢先体验其实算是一种销售的策略，或者是。一种宣传的方式，它并不应该就是说被当成说，哎、欸，我好像有两次发行机会，我有两次的发售机会，不对，你第一次发售那个就应该就要当正式上架哦，不要说，哎、欸，我可能先随便发个 early access， 然后之后可能过一年后我再想办法再正式上架，我再想办法冲一下，这个是救不，通常是救不回来的，好、哦，就是跟大家强强烈提醒。OK， so I think that's it， and、okay. you know, Thank you for your time. Thank you. And if you do have more questions,、mm -hmm. you know my website, howtomarketagame.com.、Mm -hmm. um, my contact information is there if you have any more questions. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. And bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much.